Well, good morning. Welcome. It's a good crowd. I thought I was going to be preaching to the seats. Good to have you all. Welcome to all those who are live streaming here to worship with us this morning. Just wanted to give an update. The ladies' fellowship yesterday I heard was outstanding and just a great time of fellowship and a a day. I heard beautiful uh, reports about what God has done in your life. So so thank you for serving in that way. Um, Kathy Fothergill is one of our dear saints who's been in a nursing home and been locked up for quite a bit. And I got to see her and she sends her regard and her love to this body. And Kathy, we just wanted publicly for you to know how much we, we miss you. Uh, there'll be a service this Friday for Don's uh, grandson, Zach, and uh, his daughter, Kimmy, and Donnie Beckman. And so if you'll be praying for that family, for their 23-year-old son who God called home, and, and they want to call this church their home, and so we get the joy to minister and help them uh, journey this. So I want you to keep your eyes out for Donnie and Kimmy. I just love that couple dearly already. Well, I wanted to encourage you uh, this morning just with um, the blessings and the Word of God and our, our time to be together. And so I want to go to the Lord and ask His blessing over this time in the Word of God. And so we get, a, we get to open up the Word of God this morning. Don't take that lightly that we possess the mind and heart of God. And we're going to open it up and let's ask Him to do His work in our midst. Father, I thank You for the Word of God I thank you for the revelation, the word of God, Jesus Christ, the one who perfectly has manifested you to us. God, we thank you that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. And I thank you that he has come into this world and he has accomplished redemption. And so, Father, we live in an amazing age the age of outreach, the age of salvation, the age to go and tell, to go tell it on the mountain, to lift high the cross of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we thank you for our hope that we gather together this morning, or the hope of a resurrected Christ who is endowed with salvation to all who will call upon his name. And so I pray this morning as we continue our study, Lord, I, I desire for every one of us to be as holy as as uh, brothers and sisters in Christ can be the side of glory. I pray that what we'll learn in the word this morning, Lord, just come and teach us, set us free from battles and struggles and help us to understand your game plan for sanctification. And so we, we look to you, lead and guide and work in each heart, specifically and individually. God, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll turn with me to Romans chapter Six, we will continue our study there. Paul in chapter one told us that he's a debtor to all men because of free sovereign grace, that he was going to kill Christians and God smacks him and opens his eyes and reveals his glory on the road to Damascus. And so Paul realized, I I don't deserve this grace and therefore I'm a debtor to tell all of mankind this gospel. I am indebted to let them know of a salvation that has come in Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'm eager to to preach this gospel in Rome. And and he he said that I'm unashamed of it. It's the power of God for salvation. And so Paul is beginning then to expound this gospel to us in Romans. And we spent three chapters looking at the first as the bad news that you're separated from God, you're under his wrath, and there's nothing you can do humanly to cure this problem. And that's when we came to Romans 3.21. But now, God has done something to remedy our great problem. And we began looking at the good news, and we've been for quite some time now. And and I've said before, I just feel like a little miser counting all my riches of what I have in Christ Jesus. Every verse keeps unfolding more gold and more treasure of what we have in Christ. In chapter 6, we made a transition. And we're now learning of how then shall we live in light of this glorious justification and a certain glorification that we're going to make it to heaven and be made perfect? How how do we live in between God declaring us not guilty and acceptable and the day when we're going to enter into his kingdom forever? How do we live in between such epical events? And we use the term sanctification, this time where we, we grow and being changed into the image 
of Jesus Christ. And so we've been working through chapter 6, the, the Mount Everest of sanctification. And we've, we've gone through this outline. We're looking at five truths concerning our release from the dominion of sin. And I want you to catch this. Not its presence, not its influence, not its deceit, not its tempting power, but its dominion. We have been released from the dominion of sin. <clears throat> we began in verse 1 looking at an antagonist with such a free gospel, should we just sin that grace might abound? And then our axiom was, how can you who died to sin still live in it? And then in verses 3 through 10, we've been working through this argument. Uh, we took three weeks on that, and they're all what are called indicatives in the Greek. They're what God has done. So when you are saved, God has broken the dominion of sin. You died to it, and you've been joined to Christ, and you've been made alive to walk in newness of life. And that's where we left off. And this morning, we're going to begin looking then what should be our attitude. And that is quite simply in verse 11. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So just kind of a summary. From Adam to Christ was the reign of death that we studied in chapter 5. <clears throat> Jesus hangs on a cross and he's struggling for breath, and he's under the mastery of death. And he dies, and he's buried, and a curtain closes on the reign of sin and death. And then the curtain is lifted up in scene two. On the third day, Jesus rises, raised from the dead, just as he said he would. And he inaugurates a new age. And this is the age of resurrection life, and we live in what we call the already not yet. He's accomplished it. We have resurrection life within us, and we will one day have this eternal resurrection life with him. So we still die in this body, but when we do, we're instantly made alive. And now we are given the, the resurrection life in us. And what Paul's teaching us in Romans 6 is you've been made alive to God once you were dead to him. The life that Jesus lives, he lives to God and to his glory alone, and we've been joined to that and so we used to all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that's been changed. And now we live for His glory as the center of our being and life. And so what we've been learning is you're, you're alive to God. You, in, in this gospel, you, you die to sins, control and rule, and you are made alive to the living God. And therefore, I want you to consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Very important section in our study, and I want to make sure you understand it well. Sin's guilt has been broken, and I want you to hear this gospel again. You are not guilty before God because of the work of Christ. There is no guilt. And sin's dominion was broken, and you're not enslaved to it any longer. But sin still remains it's an angry, dethroned monarch seeking to, to take its station over again. And it fights and it battles us until that glorious day of death or Christ's return of our emancipation from sin forever and ever. But we have many enemies on this road to glory. We have the world squeezing and pressing and a real devil and demons. But we have sin within we have remaining sin, and I have too many people who say, I wonder if I can be a Christian because I have remaining sin. I just want you to see that every believer has remaining sin until glory. And I want you to realize this, that sin then, remaining sin, never takes holidays or time off. They are insurgents that are always fighting for any ground that you will give to sin. They're, they're patriots fighting to take the bunker called dominion. And it's not passive. So you can't be passive. I have no greater foe or enemy in my life than remaining sin. Pogo said it, we've met the enemy and it is us. So my question this morning as we transition into this application is what is your strategy to fight this enemy? It, it will take any territory that you will give to it. You are in a battle. And any area that sin can get you to not serve God, but your lusts, it will have it gladly. 
And so I ask again, what is your strategy in fighting remaining sin as a child of God? And too often I hear people say, well, I'm forgiven and that's all that matters. That's kind of the mantra of our day. I've had people tell me I'm no different than my unsaved neighbor. I'm just forgiven. Throw out Romans 6 if that's the case. You're no different than your unsaved neighbor who's under the dominion of sin. All you need to do to grow is let go and just let God. Just coast. You're on the love boat. The battle is over. A scripture a day keeps the devil away. I only do what I feel. I'm not a hypocrite. I will wager that you are. <laughs> Spurts and fits of engaging in this battle. I grow in my faith. The battle will get easier and it will let up. It's a lie. I'm dead to sin. It can't allure me any longer. That's a lie. The lies of our great adversary that he sows books upon books of these false lies. And so we're going to begin to look at what is the truth of how do we fight this enemy within? How do we fight against an enemy called sin that is always working to take dominion in our lives? What should be our strategy? And so this morning, I want to go to Romans. I want to go to God's word through the Apostle Paul to learn how do we fight such a foe. And I want to give you a battle plan that is God's. And I, I want you to grow in grace. And so let's look at Romans 6, 11. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we'll look at that next week. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. <clears throat> and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And so this is an amazing section. So guys, I've told you this now. This, this is our first imperative in Romans. And so we've had six chapters of indicatives. And we've been studying and looking at what has God done for us in Christ Jesus their bedrock truths, their realities, uh, what we were in Adam and what God has done to save us. It's all of his doing. And he keeps saying, know them, believe them, lean on them, live upon these truths. They're, they're, you can rest your eternal souls on what God has done in Christ Jesus. And now Paul's after all of those chapters, here's your first imperative. And that should arrest so many today in the church because all we do is you walk in a church, here's your five imperatives. Do this, change this, come to church more, read your Bibles, love your wives. And we just give you imperative after imperative after imperative and that goes against God's whole program. It's what every cult, every cult teaches. Here's what you do. Christianity says this is what he did. Believe it. And go live in light of the gospel, redemption, and then righteousness. And so what is our strategy in this fight? We have a big picture of Romans 5 through 8 of our hope. Is Romans 5, 2, he says that you will not come short of the glory of God. And then in Romans 8, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You will make it to glory. So there's this hope in, in, in God's hand, and he will preserve you, and he will bring you to glory. And so I want you to hear this this morning. Some of you need to hear this. Sin does not stand in the way of your eternal inheritance. Sin is not going to take you off and lead you back under the dominion of sin. It will not win. It feels like it some days. But by God's design, it will not win. And it will not take you back to what you were in Adam. God will see to it. You're, you're under grace. He said you will. What is it? Verse 14. Sin shall not be master over you for you're not under law but under grace. That's the best news you could ever hear. <laughs> but by God's design, it will not win. God will see to it. But unlike justification where you bring nothing to this, you bring your fight. And you are just as dependent upon grace as you were for your justification. You come to sanctification dependent upon God and his grace. 
But God gives a grace that will cause you from your heart to fight in your sanctification. But pastor, I don't like to fight. I'm a lover, not a fighter. It's Valentine's Day. I'm just a lover. May I say to you that the gospel of Romans 1 through 5 will make you want to fight from every fiber of your being. I can never look at this gospel and not want to fight sin. Isn't that what happens in your heart? It just, I would never say, let me just continue in sin that grace might abound. I hate sin by the grace of God. Or once I drank it like water. I do not want it to conquer ground in my life and in my person. The cross has given me such a holy distaste for sin. I can never gaze upon it and not hate sin. So now we move into the imperative. How do we live as justified believers? Fighting the good fight of faith. My brethren, you are free to fight. And it's a good fight. It's the best fight. I pray that this is the fight that every one of you are in. It's your number one fight. The fight, the fight of faith. To believe this gospel, to live in it, to rest in it, to hope in it, and to live for our King. So we are done with its judgment. We are fighting forgiven sin. And I'm going to repeat that again and again. Every sin that you're fighting is already forgiven. That's the power of the gospel. We are done with its reigning power. We've been set free. And if the Son sets you free, what did he say? You will be free indeed. We are able now not to sin. We're alive to God to walk in newness of life. And the question is, how do I do that? Well, let's look at our first imperative of sanctification. Are you excited? Our first command. I don't even care if it's cold outside. Whatever it is, God, just give it to me. Go love. Go to church, read your Bible, pray, serve, go to the mission field. I'm just ready. What's it going to be? <laughs> None of those. Reckon. It's not a command to do something. It's not go make yourself dead to sin. Pretend you're dead to sin. Just visualize dead to sin. It's not the power of positive thinking. It's not go make a new pattern. I want you to hear this clearly. The command to the child of God is reckon. Reckon something that's true. You don't make it true. It's already done. You're going to reckon it. And Paul says, don't you know that you've been united to Christ? And when you were united to him, you died to sin and you were made alive to God. You need to know it. But most stop right there. I just learned theology. <clears throat> I get the theology of Romans 6. And I try to understand. I like to see how it all works together and getting systematics. It's, it's, it's my hobby. It's my passion. But Paul doesn't want you to stop there. You have to do that. But don't stop there. And I'm going to ask you this morning, have you stopped there? Just understand it's theology and you nod to it and you agree, I'm reformed. Do you stop there? He wants you to understand it and reckon it. To reckon it so is our first line of defense against sin. And this is so big and important, then, then what does it mean to reckon? If it all starts there, our first command, it's got to be big. But what does it mean to Americans when you hear the word reckon? I just think of, well, I reckon that's true. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, it might be true. It might not. So first, we need to get what this word meant to Paul when he penned it, because this is a big word. Reckon means thinking according to logical rules and objective reckoning to affirm in the mind that something is true and to believe it with a whole heart belief. So it takes it from knowing what he's been telling us to now I want you to take it into your heart and believe it. It's no longer just know this. 
Paul is now calling us to take this truth that we've been laboring in for the last three weeks, and he wants you to grab it with all of your hearts and to live upon this truth, to keep it close to our hearts. And I want to look at a couple passages where, where, where this word was used. Paul's going to use it again in chapter 8. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. And so this is Paul logicking out all the suffering that I'm going through. It can't compare to what's coming on the last day when you get to be with God forever. And you need to reckon it so in such a way that you can suffer right now in the present because you know what's coming. So it isn't just academically know this. You got to get it in your heart when you're suffering that this is true and this, is, this can't compare to what's really coming for me and my reward and glory. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. And so it's reckoning that, that nothing can come from me, but it's all from God. And, and it's a reckoning now that you can go out and live into the power of God. And the other one that really jumped out at me is by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. Abraham, go offer up your only son, the, prom the child of promise, the one that came when you were 100 years old. Offer him up. And, and it says that it, it was he to whom it was said, and Isaac, your descendants, shall be called. And he reckoned. He reckoned that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received his son back as a type. And so here's Abraham reckoning, okay, if I drive this knife through my son's chest, God's able to raise him from the dead. And so I, I just, I reckoned this in such a way that I could act upon it and, and actually be ready to drive a knife through my son's chest. And so this word reckon is so big that I got to get it into my heart and live upon it. I got to believe it so much. I know it and I believe it and I live my life upon it. That's what Paul's after in the Christian life. And so some of you have nodded your head to the truth the last couple of weeks, and I've done that many times, and I've forgotten to reckon in the battle. And I start believing that I couldn't overcome certain bosom sins in my life and the sins that so easily entangle me. And that is, isn't sufficient if we're going to live holy. So you've got to grab this truth by faith and cling to it, I'm dead to sin. It doesn't rule and reign me any longer. And you can't come into this and say, I always lose, I'm going to lose again. Reckon it. And reckon I'm alive to God. He has made me alive to Him to walk in newness of life. I'm free from sin's tyranny. And so I come to this battle against sin, fully persuaded and convinced that reigning sin is not a mission control center in my life anymore, and reigning grace uh, is my control center. Reckon it, regard it, conclude it. It has been done by God. His word tells us so. I don't make it happen, but I believe it with all my heart that it did happen because God said it did. Let's go to battle. That's the mindset of a warrior for Christ. Now I'm going to enter into the battle with that mindset. And why is this so hard to do? I wish this was a Bible study so you could just yell out. Maybe you could. Why is it so hard to do this? Does anyone battle with this besides me? Why is it so hard to do this? Good. Who said that? Good job, Thomas. Way to jump in there. It, unbelief, doubt. What else? What's that? The flesh. The flesh, remaining sin. We're going to be looking at sarks and understanding that it, it's the sin that so easily entangles us. So it's, it's hard to believe that I'm a person who no longer possesses a ruling sin nature on days. That I'm not a victim to my old man. That I've died and Christ lives in me. It's hard to believe that divine righteousness is wrapped around me this morning. 
It's hard to believe that I've been made fit for eternity. And it's hard to believe that the tyranny of sin is gone, that I've died to sin and I'm alive to God. It's hard for me to affirm this. And there are four reasons that I came across this week in studying why it's difficulty, uh, difficult maybe to believe this, to reckon it. Number one, no one ever told you. <laughs> Paul says, don't you know? And the answer is, no, I didn't. <laughs> I've been a, a victim of sin my whole life. I've always been controlled. And I just believe it. I, I was told in AA that you'll always be an alcoholic. And I listened to him and I believed it. I just always felt that I, I would, could never get victory over sin. This is just who I am my whole life. You've been told that and it's a lie. Second, Satan doesn't want you to believe that. He wants you to think he calls the shots. He wants you to, to believe that you still got to listen to his tyranny. And when he says jump and how high and where do I go, he wants you to keep believing that lie. Thirdly, the truths of verses 1 through 10 of chapter 6, they're non-experiential in a certain degree, and I'll explain what I mean by that later, but it's, it's not a real death. It wasn't a real crucifixion. It's a spiritual one. It's a faith fact. It's a union that produced this. And fourthly, it's a fury of the conflict with sin in us, as some days it can be so strong, it's hard to believe it's dead. Because it, can, it can feel so alive. But you are to reckon and affirm that you're dead to sin and believe that your life was written in two volumes. My old man and my new man. <clears throat> my old ended with my death in Christ and my new began with his resurrection. God has made us new and we need to reckon this and so there are three parts to reckoning. You need to have informed, conscious, and conviction. So informed, is a, it's a faith fact what God said. Sin must have tyranny over me. I can't get rid of sin. It keeps coming back. I feel, I sense that sin is still my master. And Romans 6, 1 through 10 tells us it has been broken. You need to be informed. You need to understand it then it needs to be constant. It's interesting, it's in the present tense imperative. So it's continuously, keep it ever before you. This isn't you figure it out one time and then leave it behind. This is I get up and I, I put this mindset on. I, I do it daily. As we battle sin, it must be in the forefront. My relationship to sin has changed. It no longer owns me. I walk out in this world in freedom and I'm going out, not just I'm a slave, I'm gonna blow it, I'm gonna fall again. I'm walking out constantly knowing I died to sin, but I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus. And thirdly, it's a conviction. Reckons in the active voice, it's done. It's conduct that comes out of a conclusion. I look at the truth of God's word and I believe it with all of my heart. The commentator Cranfield said, it's deliberate and sober judgment on the basis of the gospel Reasoning on the disciplines of the gospel of what God has done in Christ. We must have faith in what he's done. And so probably the biggest key out of the gate is sanctification is first in the mind and the heart before it's menial. It's not by feelings. And I know that that is the, that is the number one thing in America. And it's not by feelings. Community groups. If I only go to community group when I feel like it, I'm not going to go very often. If I only come to church when I feel like it, I'm not going to come very often. It's American Christianity. If it don't feel right, I, I don't do it. If I don't feel like having time in the Word, I don't. Hard-fought prayer at the throne of grace. Outreach. I have a neighbor over to reach out to my neighborhood and labor to have them in to share the gospel, we are just a bunch of spiritual Barry Manilows. And for those who are younger, he was a singer. He was a singer, and I raided his wardrobe this morning. And he used to get a song that said, feelings, nothing more than feelings. And it was just, that is the, it is, it's just feelings. What do I feel like? 
And what you're going to see here is that we're going to reckon this and it's going to be true and I'm going to live by what God's word says instead of how do I feel about it right now. And I'm telling you, most, most of us battle with how we feel instead of reckoning something to be true. What is it that we're to reckon? Well, we're to reckon that we're dead to sin and alive to God. So this must grip our soul is that grace has accomplished <coughs> this dead, done with its dominion. God takes out our, our heart of stone. He takes us from being joined to Adam. He joins us to Christ. Now our umbilical cord is no longer attached to Adam and this world. It's attached to Christ. He becomes our life, our food, our sustenance. And the result is we have a universal hatred of sin. We now have eyes to see sin for what it is where we didn't before. And Romans 6.21, as we journey next couple of weeks, is he's going to say, you're ashamed of the way you used to live. So now that your eyes have been opened, the, I, you know, it used to be the good old days, you know, going out and drinking and party, all these things that you did, they're the good old days. And now he opens your eyes and you're like, I'm ashamed of those days. I'm ashamed of sin. What has happened is the gospel, we've lost our heart for sin. When we were unbelievers, that was our heart. And it's been taken away with a new heart. We have a friend in the family who was an OBGYN. And he, he was, as an unbeliever, he used to perform abortions. And, and he did many. And God in his grace saved him and opened his eyes to what he had done. And since that day, he never did another abortion. And he would go and protest and fight uh, for the unborn. Why? Didn't he still have patients who wanted him? Doesn't he still have a license? Can't his hands still perform the slaughter? Yes, but he has no heart for it. His eyes have been opened, and he could never do that again. So we who once aborted the reason we existed was to glorify God was the only reason you've ever been made. And now we've been enlightened, and we see sin for what it is now. It's rebellion to God. It's rebellion against the Creator. It's not just I do a few bad things. It is that which brought Christ from glory and was slaughtered as a piece of meat up on a cross on our behalf. It is that which he despises. And so, yes, I still have members to sin with. And I still have the ability. But I don't have a heart for it anymore. It doesn't give me butterflies anymore like it used to on Friday nights in high school. It isn't what occupies my thinking all day, every day. I'm no longer like Job. He says, we drink iniquity like water. I'm dead to that rule and reign when I was an Adam. And my relationship has changed. And I've been brought into union with the living Christ. And I'm forsaking all others, keeping myself holy unto him. And so, yes, we will sin. But I want you to hear this. Not as we did as an unbeliever. You have to be deceived and tricked into it now. <laughs> then, man, game on. I was a slave and we did it joyfully. But I hear this this morning, you've died to that person. My struggle, when I was first saved, I wanted to change the world. I love the apostle Paul and I overcame a lot of sin fast. But those bosom sins just don't die easily. And subconscious, you start to believe you're not going to really overcome them. And the edges of your fight wear down a little and you expect defeat in some areas. And Paul's fighting for you this morning to reckon, to quit believing the lies and to reckon, I don't have to live this way any longer. And I'm, that's not who I am. And I'm new in Christ. And that's the second part, to reckon that you're alive to God in Christ Jesus. Are you alive to God? I love it. I'm not just dead to sin. It's great to be dead to that. Uh, that would have made me really happy. But even more so, I'm alive to God. Oh, my old address is gone. I'm, <laughs> I just want you to hear this. I'm not homeless. 
My, uh, my old home, it's gone. I was taken out of it, but I'm not homeless. I have a new home. I'm alive to God. God is real and present in a relationship. There was a time when you were dead to God. Ephesians 2, 3, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And he has made you alive together in Christ. And once, you know, I just remember his word just sat on a bookshelf. Now it's my necessary food. It was death to me to hang out with Christians. I just persecuted them. And now it's heaven on earth. And I tell you this right now, I don't need people who are just my age and in my stage of life. That's just baloney. I need people with faith in Christ of every age, every walk, different backgrounds, different colors. I just love God's people. And all shapes and sizes. That's what God does in our heart. I used to like Barry Manilow. <laughs> Now I can't help but singing the praises of God in my heart. And I could just go on and on as God made you alive to him. Brethren, what are you alive to? What is it that spurs your affections and causes your praises to go up truly? Is it the stock market? Is it sports? Holidays? Hallmark? Is it the blessed God or is it sin? I'm alive to God for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul said, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and I count them but rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. I'm so alive to him that everything I lost, I counted as loss, that I could have Christ. That's, are you alive to him? The bottom line, all that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me, and the fairest of 10,000 is my blessed Lord, I see. That's the grace of God. That is the grace of God. So as I close out, my application is Paul's application is we need to fight sin. And I don't care how many battles you've lost or how many discouragements or ground that you've given up. Decades of no progress. Repent. Believe. Know these truths and reckon them. And God is the God of new beginnings. The newness of life. Begin again. Reckon this morning. I was talking in counseling and this person was sharing that my whole life I was a politician. I lived for the approval of mankind. And I just tried to find out what would get people to like me. I, I, was, I could just, you know, whatever they liked, I liked. I just, that was my, my life. And then as a believer, there's still remaining parts of that to me. And so what it's done is it's caused me to say, well, I can't be a Christian then. And it's caused me to say, this is who I am. I can't quit being this person. And if you're sitting here this morning in the same battle, it begins with believing the gospel. That's not who I am. The, the acceptance that I want, I found in Jesus Christ. You're 100% accepted before God. That's what you've been looking for your whole life. And now to reckon, and, and when you have remaining sin that keeps coming back to who you were in Adam for all those years, that's not who I am. And see, this person was saying, that is who I am. And what it was doing is causing more and more living into it and, and acting out that way and then throwing away the gospel because it can't be mine. And so what I want you to see is the beauty of this passage is to believe the gospel and then to reckon that isn't who I am. And you can begin to fight sin in the power of God and in a whole new way. And so I pray that this would break in and set people free. And then I want to quote Average Joe, my new hero. As Joe, the Average Joe stood here last week 
He had a sin, and he was feeding it by pride to be appreciated and, and look at what all I do. And he said the sin just kept growing, and he's, he's feeding it. And it, it's taking ground, and it's beginning to hurt his marriage and hurt his kids and his, the people he works with. It's spreading. And I'll tell you this, if sin was his master, it would have taken him over, and average Joe wouldn't be here this morning. He would have died a broken and lonely man sharing where his heart was wanting to go. But the grace of God is that sin could not reign again. And one day before God, with all of his declension, a bomb of grace went off in his heart. And it took back so much ground and gained new ground. But now he's so ready because of God, he's just alive to him to kill all the insurgents that are fighting and to grow in grace. That's what this gospel does. And so I want us all to, to reckon this morning what is true of us in Christ Jesus. And next week, we're going to learn how to not let sin reign and how to not give our members to serve it. And then the week after that, if the Lord tarries and I'm alive, we're going to look that you're, you're not under law, but under grace. And what that does in the power of the fight against sin is unbelievable. So I'm going to fight you to get you if you're a law guy and you're living under it. I'm going to be your worst enemy for the next month or year. So, so come under grace or leave. You're going to hate me, I promise. Grace is too good. to don't, Moses or Jesus, who do you want? Give me Jesus. All right, so as I close out, I'm going to one last word to the unbeliever and then I'm going to make some application is I've got something so special to offer you. Most people, when God starts working in your life, you want to come to church, clean up your life, be a better person, start being around Christians. I'm telling you, that's not the gospel. You'll never be able to change. You'll, you'll shuffle the furniture on the Titanic and go to church for 20 years and be the same person at the end of 20 years. There's a Savior came into this world and said, come to me with all your sin. Don't clean up. Come as a sinner and I'll clean you up. I will wash away every sin that you've ever committed by hanging on a cross in your place. And I'll wrap you in my garment of righteousness, the perfect obedience that I gave to the Father. I'll put to your account. And now God will accept you and forgive you and adopt you and bring you into his family. And he'll break the dominion of sin and begin to change you and transform you from one image of glory to the next. Isn't that better than pull yourself up by the bootstraps and keep breaking them and be miserable and go from one group to club to new way of thinking? There's a savior came to save sinners. And he says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest.